Well, I think we are ready to start our afternoon sessions. Um, if you are just joining us, um, I wanted to let you know if you have any questions uh, during the presentation or during the Q&A to submit those to the Q&A module. And if you have any trouble uh, troubleshooting issues, please send those through chat. Um, also, we are going to record this session and it will be available for you to go back and listen to along with the presentation slides after the conference. Um, and I just wanted to mention today our moderator for the Q&A is Alicia. She was here this morning, so she's back with us again. Um, and also, if you want to look at the abstract for this session and the other ones afterwards, uh, you can go to our website, New Prairie Press org forward slash cpn dam and you can take a look at that there um, so our presentation right now is developing an outreach plan for university of north texas scholarly works uh, this is going to be presented by pamela andrews who is the repository librarian for scholarly works um, and daniel alumna I apologize if I said that incorrectly, who is the digital curation coordinator, and they are both from the University of North Texas, and I will hand it off to them. All right, thank you very much, Amanda, and everybody, hi, uh, and greetings from Texas, University of North Texas. Uh, today, uh, we would like to share uh, some of our uh, initiatives that we are working on this year and uh, specifically uh, how we are uh, planning or strategizing uh, to expand our outreach to uh, reach faculty members who are the uh, contributors and the producers of scholarly works. Uh, before we go to our uh, uh, presentation, uh, just to give you a brief background of our current status of the uh, scholarly communication. And as you all know, uh, we have witnessed uh, a critical period of uh, change uh, in the landscape of uh, research for uh, both higher education and libraries, uh, specifically you know, in terms of access to research publications. And uh, the thing has been, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, overwhelmed by the pro proliferation uh, of uh, new disciplines and the growth of your know, scientific and scholarly uh, publication. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, you know, our library, our university library, uh, uniquely uh, suited uh, to leading the transformative uh, change on the uh, university campus in general and in this regard. So there is an understanding of both the opportunities and also the issues and costs associated uh, to uh, this transition uh, with, the, with the library. So uh, based on this uh, uh, central and transformative change, uh, we come up with initiatives that undertake uh, on uh, even in you know, national and international level, uh, following the campaign uh, to meet with uh, different colleagues and universities to foster an understanding of uh, those disparate ends. So that's why we host uh, an annual uh, conferences, you know, open access conferences, very famous uh, for the last five years. We hosted a very successful conference discussing various issues associated with the scholarly communications. And also uh, within our libraries, we put together different task forces and groups. Uh, uh, for example, one of the new initiatives is uh, we established a scholarly communication uh, transform transformation initiative team or task force, uh, which essentially uh, try to um, address this issue and mobilize uh, uh, change in scholarly communication uh, within our campus uh, to engage the campus within the you know, system issue, uh, whether it's cost of the journal or or or, or uh, contributing to our institutional repository. So uh, Pamela here, our institutional repository, uh, try to expand our institutional repository collection. Uh, she will give you a detailed uh, statistical data. But the current participation of faculty members are really, really small. And it's one fourth of the faculty that participated. And we really want to push that to at least 50%, half of it, in, in the coming two years. In order to do that, we need to come up with ways and strategies that can help us to convince them and, uh, and, and help them to understand why it's important to put their, uh, their works within uh, our institution and uh, scholarly works. So that's the motivation uh, we have, and based on our uh, preliminary analysis of you know who are our contributors, uh, 
uh, why they contribute and why not they don't contribute. I mean, I think five percent. After we identify the issue, then we come up with um, possible short-term and long-term solutions that we can pass to address and expand the participation of faculty members. So uh, I will let uh, Pamela uh, uh, discuss and describe the, our methodology and, uh, and, and findings, and then uh, come back and uh, uh, kind of discuss our summary conclusion and uh, so continue our conversation during our uh, questioning. Oh. Right. So to begin, um, especially as coming in to UNT for the repository, um, institutional repository, which we call the UNT Scholarly Works Collection. One of the first things I wanted to do was find out what exactly is in our collection. And so here you can see statistics of our collection. Um, for the past year, you can see our usages. Um, per month, we average about 20,000 views per month for our collection. Uh, we have roughly 4,000 items, but what I wanted to dig into was who in our faculty are contributing and who isn't. So these were my beginning research questions for creating this analysis of the collection. So who has and has not contributed? Where do departments and colleges stand in regards to the collection? Um, where are our contributors in the tenure process? And then what types of items are they contributing? And does this have any influence on their participation? So what I initially did is because we don't subscribe to any um, current research information systems or other um, more systematic um, dictators of our faculty scholarship was I use publicly available faculty senate data and our human resources data to create this target population of current active campus faculty. Um, I did remove, remove a few people under that code, ESL instructors, visiting faculty, um, and adjuncts, uh, and this does not include our other campuses. So this is just a UNT Denton main campus. And once I had that list of our target population, I began searching for them within the collection and pulling um, how many items each had contributed. And as I was looking through this, it yielded more questions about research types and tenure status that we'll look at as well. So this data is generated from two searches over the summer, um, one in June 29th, and then the second go through to confirm my numbers in July 18th. Um, and so, that was initially with our faculty senate data. Uh, I combined it with our HR data as well to get a total population of 1,600 community members. Um, 757 of these were not listed on the faculty senate data, so there was a discrepancy in who we kind of count as faculty. And also 608 of our faculty are adjuncts, meaning that 35% of our campus faculty are adjuncts. Um, and HR also weirdly did not count librarians despite us holding non-tenure track status. So it's an interesting kind of um, composition of both lists. So our overall number, um, as Daniel said, we have a quarter of our faculty contributing to the, um, to the repository and actually it's 27% once you add librarians to it. So really overall we're looking at 27% of our faculty contributing to the scholarly works collection. So with this, a breakdown, a general breakdown of it would be, so from my 1600, I called out the visiting faculty, the adjunct faculty, uh, ESL instructors, and some administrators who are not active within their um, department, and whittled it down to 1100. Of these 309 faculty members contribute to Scarly Works, representing 52 out of 62 departments, and nine out of 10 colleges plus the libraries. Now from our overall collection of the 4,000 items, they're accounting for 74% of that collection. So that shows us that we're also getting a lot of um, emeritus or retired um, and alumni faculty within that combination as well. So this is a list of who is actually contributing to our repository. I rank them in terms of percentage of faculty. Um, you can see UNT Libraries is leading away at 88%, followed by College of Information, which is, again, what you would hope to see. Uh, and then surprisingly by Engineering, Arts and Sciences, PACs. And you'll see as you get towards the end that the more um, industrial or professional oriented colleges, uh, such as business, music, and journalism, are our lowest percentages. And so that kind of points to this uh, trend between considering, say, academic scholarship versus 
scholarship produced for industry or for professionalism and pointing to a need to, to close that gap and to find a way to represent their scholarship within our collection as well. So looking at the department level, uh, these are the departments with at least 50% of their faculty contributing to scholarly works. So you see STEM at the top, followed closely by philosophy and religion, and then library and information studies. And then some social sciences as well scattered around. So um, you do see the big players, bio and chemistry, uh, but at the same time, it is interesting to see other fields higher up, some that we may not have initially considered to be strong advocates of open access or to have um, items that lend them themselves to being deposited in the open access repository. So looking at tenure status, um, it's initially what you would expect to see. 44% are professors, 42% are associate professors. So they've already been through the tenure status. They've at least gone through one one promotion and tenure stage, essentially. So they know what's going on, it's not as surprising, whereas assistant professors are still kind of battling it out and so may not be as inclined to look towards open access outlets, especially if their discipline is saying, we must publish in these specific subscription journals to be considered for tenure. Uh, we also have our lecturer faculty, uh, not as many, uh, 16 against the 243 tenure track, um, but at the same time, it is encouraging to see that they have a presence within the repository and are another uh, population we should be encouraging. Um, however, you can see that the highest percentages are with our principal uh, continuing lecturers and, and they have a continuing appointment. So similar to that getting past the tenure status, 31% um, of our lecturers though do not have a continuing appointment at the time. So this would be interesting to explore further and see if they're looking to move into a tenure line position um, or if they're looking to produce more scholarship to get into a continuing appointment and how the institutional repository can help them with that goal. So then by resource type, which was the third kind of breakdown we included. Um, as a baseline, we do have substantially more articles and this is and do talk part to our open access policy because it is specifically targeting um, peer reviewed journal articles as part of that policy. But at the same time, we do have a lot of presentations, papers, um, and posters. And so I've included over the next two slides, the top three resource types per college. So you can see across the board that we do value articles much more highly than say other forms, but it is interesting to see, especially with College of Engineering and Music, how papers become more of value, or at least more uh, willing to deposit within those groups. Uh, and then again, looking towards more of our professional colleges, um, visual arts and design, of course, is privileging artwork, images, and physical objects. Um, but the College of Merchandising also is more of posters uh, rather than papers and articles. So that points to a place where we can talk with them about where and, and how they're producing these posters for scholarship and if we can again incorporate them into the repository on a greater level. And then of course with libraries, uh, we do a lot of presentations and that is the forefront, but we're, we're catching up with articles as well and then substantially posters. And this goes back to the 88% of our faculty librarians depositing is you do see substantially higher um, material numbers. So looking just at this analysis that we did in the summer, we kind of created some future plans and out of this through our outreach plan that we'll talk about um, next. Uh, but initially what we did is want to find out where is the remaining um, percentage of our collection coming from? Is it emeritus and alumni members? How can we measure that? How can we encourage that? And also showcase the materials that we have to create greater traffic. Um, we also want to focus on underrepresented departments, specifically those 11 departments who have not yet contributed to the repository. And now that we know who they are, or who's missing, we can um, be more precise on that front. Uh, we also want to leverage more collaborations between, say, the Honors College, um, which is another venue for creating a lot of posters, especially for the College of Merchandising, uh, and patents as well, 
um, and then how to kind of create a better space for industry-based disciplines and incorporate the types of collaboration occurring across faculty and student works as well um, to create a more diverse repository. Okay, <laughs> the second part is uh, based on the data we collected, uh, we developed our outreach plan. So uh, essentially our stakeholders are so diverse. Uh, as as uh, you know, Panel I showed you, uh, the contributors, even if uh, there is some disciplinary characteristics, there, there are also some specific uh, personal uh, interest that, that affects uh, why the, uh, the, they would contribute to our research or why not. Uh, one of the things we uh, uh, try to address in this is uh, to use the students. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, based on based on the the, the preliminary data, uh, like we we pick uh, as initial first approach to uh, use how many faculties uh, collaborate with the students. So uh, in order to uh, reach faculty through students, we as uh, kind of come up with a new collection that, that separates faculty works from student works. So because uh, during our initial uh, Period when we do the research poetry, one of the concerns that our members raised was what the difference between ETD and the other types of uh, scholarly works. So, in order to answer that question clearly, we completely separated ETD. But now, when we think about other scholarly works, non ETD student works, uh, we identified there are some student works which are not categorized as ETD and which are not quite uh, journal articles or. Uh, through a peer reviewing process, but there are still, they have some uh, scholarly value, which we want to uh, collect as, as scholarly, of, you know, scholarly outputs of UNT uh, students and faculty. So uh, we identified uh, even some undergrad uh, students that have been really engaged in uh, scholarly works. So the first, uh, the first strategy is to uh, approach those faculty members to collaborate with with students. And uh, surprisingly, we identified quite a number of faculty members who have some uh, quite interesting works, but they never uh, contributed anything other than the one uh, with their students. So that's one, one thing uh, kind of surprising for us, but, but we it as one strategy, we should, we should approach that uh, as, as one strategy to increase our faculty members' uh, participation. Great. Right. So uh, as Daniel mentioned earlier, our goal after this analysis is to double our number of items collected and our faculty contributors. Uh, and it has been looking at these different kinds of collaborations with students um, through resource types that has helped us kind of hone in on an outreach plan to accomplish this goal. So this is uh, essentially a high level overview of our outreach plan. So our goal is for the collection to be seen as a valued, necessary resource to the UNT community. And we want to do this through three objectives. We want to increase the number of faculty contributors um, with the short goal of increasing by 25% in the next year, uh, to increase the number of submissions to Scholarly Works Collection, and then also to increase visibility and traffic by 10% over the, this year. So with that targeted departmental outreach, it, it took kind of looking through the data and seeing, okay, these are the 11 departments that do not have anything in our collection. Let's get some representation from them first um, through either student collaborations or um, other interdisciplinary initiatives that they're part of, and also speak with, with our liaisons and see who may be more open to depositing work within a repository or is interested in open access work and using those leads to start building those departments' um, collections. So we also noticed an interesting trend with department chairs. So for every department that had their chair contributing to the collection, um, it brought other faculty with them, which is a bit of a, a common sense confirmation. You would think that you get larger buy-in and then it trickles down, which is what it did uh, with an average of seven faculty per department with a department chair represented in the collection. So we certainly want to use that to our advantage as well and target those specific faculty members. 
Uh, and then we also um, are going where they are, um, seeing if they have any in-house events. So like Daniel mentioned, how a lot of them have been contributing student collaborations, but not their own work. So going to them in their um, in-house departmental events, like this fall, our history department did a um, in-house departmental conference. So talking with them about bringing in the student submissions and using that as a foot in the door, in a sense, to then talk with the faculty about putting their own research in the repository. Um, and then also kind of creating this culture of associating the department or departmental scholarship with the uh, scholarly works collection. Um, so again, there we have the trickle down effect that we still want to um, take part in. Uh, and then we also want to find a way to outreach to underrepresented job titles. And that's not in our initial strategy, but it is something we want to keep in the back of our mind, especially what can we do for lecturers. Um, in their promotion and tenure meetings, there um, they mentioned creating uh, extraordinary works that help forward their goal of teaching. Well, it's hard to imagine what that looks like. Sometimes. So if we can find a way to help them input some of their materials in the repository, we can also use this as a resource for other incoming lecturers and build it as a resource for understanding what kind of scholarship is anticipated at the university at that level. And then we also want to let the university itself guide some of our choices. So we do mediated deposit, but at the same time, we want to start following or continue following university trends. So our distinguished research professorships, distinguished teaching professorships, these are typically faculty members who have either started on, on creating a legacy for themselves or being recognized for that legacy of scholarship. And so we want to find a way to bring it into the show, into scholarly work so that it can work further as a showcase for, again, aspiring faculty members and also for the university to promote the awards themselves by saying, now look at all of their scholarship available here. So um, secondly, we want to recruit contributions by activating what I'm calling passive contributors. So these are, as we mentioned before, the faculty members that Daniel and I identified as only having in student co collaborations, um, which were even deposited by the honors college. So they may have no idea that they're actually in the collection. Um, so we specifically set a criteria of looking at faculty who have less than five items in the collection, and then seeing if we can contact them to get in more, to get in the bulk of their primary scholarship. And that way we can take these who only have like maybe a passing interest or knowledge or none at all of the collection and really turn them into an advocate for us. Um, and then we also want to solicit contributions from multidisciplinary programs. So we have a number of research centers um, such as the Center for Advanced Computing and Research, there's um, epidemiology, and other initiatives that we're looking at that include a number of different departments or that departments house. And these may employ postdoc researchers and other larger collaborations that we want to showcase. They just aren't turning up in our initial searches or if we talk to a faculty member, they'd be more, they may be more interested in archiving their um, primary scholarship and consider that to be a secondary resource. And so making sure that we value and, and harvest that as well. And then again, looking at our pool of emeritus or retired faculty for legacy contributions. So soliciting submissions from them is not necessarily going to increase our percentage of active campus faculty that we're targeting the increase. However, it does bring in a lot of submissions and we do want to make sure that they're represented within UNT and have a place to store their scholarship, especially as older publications may not be as available anymore. So this is where we really uh, mention our desire to preserve their scholarship, not just to make it necessarily open, though, of course, we want to and will do that as well, but to make sure that they can preserve their legacy. Um, so I mentioned passive contributors. Um, we also identify those as passive who are creating uh, Creative Commons licensed material, which is wonderful and we're very excited about. Um, but I can go ahead and harvest without their participation. So I want to be able to congratulate them on making their work open, um, saying we very much appreciate it and your, your attention to this need to open scholarship. 
Um, can we work on other items in your CV that may be subscription and get those in the repository as well? So making them more of an active contributor and pushing your scholarship open. Um, and then also working with those collaborations such as the Honors College who are depositing a large amount of material, but as a way to uh, preserve their own initiatives and not necessarily as part of that faculty's pool of scholarship. So to then say, oh, we noticed you have this poster from your collaboration with undergraduate research from last year's Honors Day. Um, would you be interested in archiving these other articles of yours within the repository as well? So for our third objective, um, and there are actually a couple of different strategies, and this is more in promoting the collection itself, because one of the strongest tools to promote the collection to faculty is to demonstrate its value. Uh, and so we can go ahead and do that with our current collections, but by really promoting it as a public relations tool for the university, we can do a lot more. So specifically, we want to look at student groups targeted for recruitment, especially as a lot of our items come from those types of uh, collaborations. So talking with the admissions office to say, uh, so as they go to different college fairs, if a student is interested in working with a specific department or a specific faculty member, they can easily say, well, check out our scholarly works collection and see what they've been doing this past year or two. And that way they can see not only the faculty member's scholarship, but also the kinds of collaborations that they're interested in. And it helps the student identify potential mentors and see what they could accomplish if they became a UNT community member as well. Um, and one of those um, outreach programs is through the McNair Scholars, and that's a pilot program we're currently working on with the Honors College to archive those posters and to document that kind of mentorship and scholarship being produced um, with our undergraduate population. Um, and then secondly, we want to leverage those existing public relations strategies from the university. Um, so we currently have a spotlight, a scholarly work spotlight in our internal newspaper, Friday Frags, um, and it's been running for about four weeks now. Um, and there's, you can see the considerable bump to views for each item that we highlight. So one of the interesting things you can do with our uh, collection is see when those spikes occur so that you can track it due to, like, did, did I promote this at the conference? Um, how many people viewed it afterward? How can I kind of track that usage and attention? And so we, it's, we can uh, look at this bump and views from our Spotlight series and use this to demonstrate how it can be helpful for um, university public relations as well. So when they create their social media outreach, if they tweet about a faculty member's research or highlight it on Facebook, they can uh, talk about the research, but also link back to that faculty member's collection and say, look here for more of their scholarship or if you're interested in other things that they're doing so that we can kind of collaborate to give a bump both to the faculty member's prestige and um, publicity, but also to their items as well and possibly increase uh, usage and citations as well. Um, so with this outreach plan, our methods of assessment uh, or evaluation rather are fairly simple in that sense of um, we have two plans to evaluate and a lot of it is using the current statistics generated by our collection. Um, but we do plan on creating an annual white paper detailing it, our increases in contributors and contributions. Uh, and then also using the collection and item statistics to demonstrate value to potential contributors and to also track specific promotions. So again, whenever a collection is tweeted um, or linked on Facebook, and that way we can kind of correspond uh, usage to different outreach methods and identify which public relations strategies are of better value to us. Uh, so yeah, essentially uh, we employ all sorts of <coughs> methodology, uh, bottom up through students and even publications from elsewhere and also by using a faculty profile system, what they have there and finding and then approaching them or through their uh, faculty chair or tenure and promotion committee by, by involving uh, to uh, give value to scholarly works and, and to kind of enforce and reinforce the value of depositing uh, UNT uh, faculty works into our institutional repository. 
So the takeaway from our approach is there is no one uh, single way uh, you know, method that can address all issues. We have to address and segment the uh, stakeholders based on various factors and approach in a way that can uh, really address those, those communities. So we have to uh, apply multiple, multiple uh, approach. And again, our goal is pretty bold. Uh, so far, you know, since we have started this joint policy, which is our fourth or fifth year, and we have only 4,000 items. So in the next two years, our goal is to double it to 8,000. You know, that's that's really pretty bold because we we have used all methods to get 25 percent faculty participation. So it just you can imagine how uh, difficult it's going to be uh, to 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 and recreate our methodology and uh, recreate our collection to, to them. So both direction, in terms of collection from 4,000 to 8,000, in terms of faculty participation from 25% to 50% in the next two years. So this is our first year and this is our first semester and essentially we are on zero ground right now, but we stretch our hands and we're kind of seeding the seeds and we are hoping to see the fruits you know, in the next, you know, we don't expect it maybe the next semester, but next year, hopefully, we will see significant uh, effect of our efforts of these promotional activities. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, I will uh, give you uh, uh, open for question and discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very interesting presentation. Um, Got a couple questions from the audience that I'm going to run over. Um, have these tactics been done before? And if so, how will it be different this time compared to previous times? Uh, so that, that is a very good question. Um, and some of these will be repeat attempts. Um, but we have there's essentially two, two variances from it. Um, so first, our previous repository librarian, uh, Laura Wall, who did an amazing job in getting us 25%, um, she leveraged a lot of personal connections um, and really kind of went after big fish to get in a, a lot of contributions and with that she got in a lot of collaboration. So we're also continuing that approach, but we're trying to expand it by kind of going bottom up as well, using leveraging student collaborations and initiatives to kind of get those um, assistant professors who are maybe interested in stretching their wings towards mentorship, and then also the associate professors who aren't quite the, the biggest fish yet, but they're getting there. Um, and so we want to make sure that we become part of their process in securing their next stage of tenure and promotion. Um, the second, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, actually, oh, wait, if you want to add another yeah, yeah. factor. So, yeah, some of them are repeated, you know, uh, attempts, but some of them are new uh, strategies. So, kind of, we are combining, you know, uh, what works, we build on that, and what did works, kind of change, modify, and come up with some new methods. So, it's a combination of all the new. Okay. Oh, also, um, in 2012, our open access policy passed, and part of that was building an open access advisory board. Um, this year, we have finally appointed members, and that's taking off. So we should have a lot more faculty buy-in um, and administrative um, buy-in as well to fortify our efforts as well. And that's something we did not have previously. Well, very interesting. Um, maybe if you could expand on that last part. Um, one of the questions is, how will you address resistance from departments, faculty, students, and staff with the, your outreach plan that you have laid out? Right, so there, there will definitely be resistance. Um, what we plan to do, is, so having the Open Access Advisory Board is going to be very helpful for that because we'll have um, people to point towards to say they also believe in, in open access and scholarship, and that board is made up of, um, has an assistant professor, associate professor, and, and full professors all part of it. Um, and so with that resistance, we're not necessarily trying to do a full-scale conversion to, to open access, but we do want to kind of, um, like Daniel said before, kind of reach into a little bit of everything to, to kind of pull the campus as a whole towards that initiative. Um, and so for those outliers who show resistance, um, 
that that's fine and they'll have resistance but i'm going to continue speaking about it anyway uh, and so a, a colleague uh, mentioned previously like you have those people who hold out um, and say you're never going to change me and that's fine maybe you will maybe you won't um, but the point is to continue advocating for it and hoping that this kind of groundswell of peer pressure uh, or really just kind of um, seeing this culture shift towards it that we're hoping we can get by getting both students and faculty kind of coming together as a whole will help to mollify some of that resistance. Yeah, and yeah, there are multiple pulling and pushing factors uh, in play, uh, international, national, and even local. So we use every opportunity to, to develop, you know, our goal is 50 percent it's not 100 percent because we know that there is always you know significant number you know who stay behind and wait and see you know approach like any diffusion of innovation theory you know tells us there's always you know different category groups so there's no 100 percent adoption particularly in this kind of contagious issue but you know the factors that help us right now is like some national trends for example uh, White House white paper is very helpful. The funding uh, agencies requirements is very helpful. Like very few faculty just because of the funding requirement approach us, you know, okay, how can we work together? How can we uh, write a policy or even data management policy for this funding? And because of that requirement, we were able to work with some faculty members. So that's a good thing. And we uh, host open access conference, very uh, successful open access conference annually and every year we choose some thematic issue and it really helped us to educate the campus we try to involve uh, some faculty members in the campus and we use that opportunity to to kind of share uh, some of the values that can come up from uh, open access issue and i think we, we really succeeded in that and we have administration support right now and we are considering uh, even to make part of uh, PNT promotion tenure uh, officially. Uh, it, it, that was not unthinkable like three years ago. So there is there is a, some positive environment that kind of uh, used it to as 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 I call it more, uh, I'll, I'll call it pushing factor locally. But yeah, there, there will be always a resistance. Our goal is to minimize that we know that we can't avoid it. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question. Have you come up with next steps if you meet or do not meet your goals in 2017? Huh. No, that's a good question. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think our next steps would be if we if we do fall short, which very well could happen, um, it's a time to kind of assess our strategy. So as we mentioned, having that evaluation criteria, uh, methods with um, uh, our white paper, but also through our collection statistics and using that as kind of a sounding board for did this increase, increase a lot of views? Um, did this really get a lot of people on board? Was this initiative an, ineffective? Um, and that way we can kind of fine tune it using, again, more local data and go from there. Uh, if we succeed, I think we'll just throw a party and then, and then hope we can do it again the next year. But again, taking account of um, uh, Finding out as we go what's going to fail, what's going to succeed, and kind of um, looking at that from a more systematic way. Because previously, and I think for a lot of repositories, they're kind of created through serendipity. And so we want to see if we can apply um, more kind of empirical methods to, to track and leverage that into further growth. Great. A party sounds like a good idea. Um, one more question. How are you addressing the growing literature of digital projects being created by students for their classes or master projects? Uh, will those be included in the institutional repository? Uh, if really get to the point that the problem, we call it a good problem, because right now really small and minimum, but it's not part of uh, faculty work. It is it within our institutional repository, but it's different quality. So essentially, right now we have kind of four categories: it's, uh, faculty work, faculty and staff work, which is the main uh, institutional repository uh, uh, collection. ETD, completely different collection. Undergrad work, 
different collection and graduate work different collection. So it is like four different umbrella, but the big umbrella is like political, but the, the collection is different. So faculty members are very particular uh, about not mixing their works with, uh, you know, such kind of wide uh, gap of you know, quality. So in order to address that, we separated that, but, but we at the same time respect the value, the scholarly value of those content, so we want to collect them. So, you know, we started that initiative this year uh, with, with this plan. Uh, one of the things we uh, come up with is to create a collection for undergrad and grad. And right now it's really, really small, very, very small. So, good, like, having that problem, we we'll call it good problem. Right, and part of the reason we separated them out is that so we can also acknowledge and recognize single authored student works that may not fit into the faculty collection because they're not co-authored with the faculty member. Uh, and so we have that method, but I think um, part of your question is also about student work generated in the classroom, which uh, right now we're not taking in mostly because of FERPA issues. Um, now, the university did kind of solve that problem for us in a way in that we recently did a QEP project that, the, that incorporated an e-portfolio system. And so undergraduates are going to be encouraged to post or, or to decide whether or not to make that work available. Um, and if they do, it'll be of their their own will, um, they'll want of their own um, choice, and we'll have a platform to display that. That's entirely outside of the digital library and the scholarly works collection. So there is a mechanism for them to recognize that, um, but we still want to help them. So say there was a digital, a born digital project on that a student did for their class that they really want to kind of maybe develop further. Um, and so they create this project. What they might do is be encouraged to go to, say, an undergraduate research conference and create a presentation or poster or other supplementary scholarship item about the born digital work. And so we would gladly preserve the, the presentation or the poster um, or any articles created about that work, but not necessarily the work itself. We haven't run into that problem yet, but that is something we, a good problem to think about. And if you are uh, talking about the type of varieties of uh, content, we already experienced that uh, with the ETD uh, output. Most ETDs right now are not the usual kind of uh, PDF version a lot. They, have, they included and incorporated some supplemental files that are multimedia content, which require different approach. And our system allow and encourage to uh, Included every everything that that has any value to produce or uh, including even data set. Although uh, it's not quite, uh, you know, we haven't received that many that data set, but we received a number of supplemental files, particularly for music, for example. Before they uh, graduate, they have to perform at least four recitals, and all those four recitals will be part of uh, will be linked with the ETDs in our system to provide those facilities too. So that, that for other types of student works, if it is classwork, we don't, we have collection policy, we don't take those kinds of things. It's completely more uh, scholarly works. It is, there is some sort of third person uh, quality assurance involved in that. So it's not classwork, but you know, other than classwork. Right, so limiting it to something that's been accepted to a public professional organization or to a scholarly journal, um, that's our criteria for putting something in the student collection so that we can kind of create a boundary between class-created items and more scholarly items. All right, um, that's the final question I have for you both. But thank you so much for this very enlightening presentation. Um, we will be taking a 10-minute intermission, returning at 2.55, Central Time uh, with our final presenter. Uh, so thank you.